Hi everyone, I'm Chrissy Regan and I'm joined today by the wonderful Loretta Woodford from Parent Medic North Queensland. How are you Loretta? I'm good thanks Chrissy, how are you? Good, so we're both in the tropics at the moment uh, but it's a cooler day so I'm kind of grateful for the reprieve in the heat. What about you? Oh yes, we've had a little bit of rain so that was nice um, coming into summer and it's nice to get rain up here. It is. It's nice to have a green Christmas, let alone a white Christmas, which we won't be having anytime soon. <laughs> um, no. So tell me a little bit about Paramet Parent Medic and why you started it. Um, so I'm a registered nurse and mm -hmm. as a registered nurse, I was just looking for something a little more. Um, as if I'm not crazy enough being a nurse and, and working eight shifts a fortnight. But I actually came across an ad um, for a baby first aid business. And I did a little bit of research because I thought, oh, I wonder if there's anything like that up here in North Queensland. Mm -hmm. um, and originally I thought Townsville and I couldn't really find anything. But I actually found that there was a gap in the market um, mm -hmm. in North Queensland with no permanent baby first aid providers up this way. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where, I, where, it, where it all started. How long ago was that? Um, so that would have been when I saw the ad, it would have been December. I was thinking the years are going really quickly, but December 2020 right. um, mm -hmm. is when I saw the ad. And I actually started the business in um, April 2021. So about 18 months, just uh, yeah, about 18, 20 months ago. So you're one of the crazy people that started a new business during COVID, basically. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> and you're still working as a registered nurse at the moment. Yes. Yeah, so I actually work eight shifts a fortnight as, right. as well as run my business. Mm -hmm. And you've got grown up children. I do. So I've got grown up, three grown up children and four grandchildren. Wow. So, yeah, so at the time when I looked at this, I had three plus a pregnant daughter. So now I've got four little ones from four, three, two and one. Congratulations. Thanks. I'm interested because I've had some interesting baby first aid experiences, which I think I'll share with you as we chat today. But can you tell me what are the three most common things for parents that you find when it comes to first aid? Either they should know, need to know, or have to do whether they want to or not? Um, I think we look at people um, basically come to me for first aid for things like choking. So mm. um, choking and allergies, I think, are the two most um, sought after first aid topics. And that's because when our baby's around four to six months of age, they start solids. So people are worried about them choking on food and also allergies with certain types of food. And then I think the third topic is probably head injury because, um, you know, people are really worried, oh, what do I do if my child, you know, bumps its head? So they're probably the three top um, topics that we get. Mm, yeah, so and then I guess new parents probably be slightly more anxious than parents who have multiple children I'd imagine. Definitely. Do you find that parents with more than one children tend to be a little bit more relaxed about things than the first firstborn parents? Yeah they tend to be um, a little more relaxed but I still have a lot of um, parents you know with subsequent um, children coming along to the first aids because they they say, oh, I've forgotten some of the things that I learnt for the first one. So, yeah. yeah. And that's good. And we are starting school holidays in North Queensland and it's a long holiday. It's two months um, for most people. And it's summer as well, which obviously in the tropics adds a different dimension to things. So what would you advise people to have in their medicine cabinet or in their first aid box going into this long, hot summer? Okay. So some of the things I, I think about when I'm looking at um, first aid kits. So depending on where you are, something like sanitizing wipes. So get your hands nice and clean before you start um, getting into whatever you need to. Um, it's always really good to have disposable gloves in your first aid kit as well. 
Um, so some sort of antiseptic, whether it be wipes or cream. So for those cuts and grazes to make sure they're nice and clean. Um, before you put the band-aids on. So band-aids is the next thing on the list um, or, or dressings. Um, yes, we've got a long summer and our summer's hot. So we probably want some sunscreen for when the kids are outside. They do a lot of swimming and outdoor activities. So sunscreen, um, your insect repellent. Um, so there's lots of mozzies and things around in summer. Um, also look at an antihistamine too, because sometimes, um, you know, they can get rashes or bites and things which may, um, they may have an allergy to. So always check with your pharmacist to get an antihistamine that's suitable for kids. Um, also something like paracetamol or ibuprofen. Um, so check with your pharmacist on dosages for those. Um, and then have things like scissors and tweezers and things for splinters and cutting, you know, bandages and things like that. Mm. And I guess goes in hand in hand with the sun cream, but a bit of after sun doesn't go astray either, right? Definitely not. <laughs> I have one child with olive skin and one child with very fair skin. So I'm kind of balancing the two needs of the one that gets very red and burns quickly and the one that turns into a little gum nut baby. So, um, but that's interesting. I also, um, my youngest child suffers terribly with bites. She is like, you know, there's whatever is always drawn to her and she welts up and gets very big sores and gets very inflamed very quickly. And I know I ended up at ER in uh, the Noosa Hospital uh, two Christmases ago because her hand just swelled up like a balloon, you know, and it's really upsetting because it's so painful for them and you there's sometimes not a lot you can do except to ice it and to to give the antihistamines. I'm guessing you've seen that a lot yourself. Yeah, and I think something I keep in my cupboard at home is stop itch as well. So when they start getting itchy, mm. and I know where I live, I live right near the beach and there's lots of mozzies and sandflies. Mm. So the sandflies, you know, on that dusk and dawn, they get stuck into me. And so stop itch is really good to have in your first aid kit as well. Yes, we have some stoppage. We have multiple versions of that type of, <laughs> of ointment <laughs> and the antihistamines. My oldest daughter's been suffering with hay fever really badly this summer or this springtime. Um, have you seen a lot of hay fever? No, not so much hay fever. Um, yeah, I haven't seen a lot. But, um, yeah, I suppose some people tend to manage hay fever at home. Mm -hmm. um, with antihistamines yeah 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 she just gets to the point where it's almost impossible for her to breathe so it can be quite distressing for her and um I was interested when you talked about choking because I had a very choky baby I brought my baby home from hospital and within a few hours she started choking and she would choke on air for no reason all the time feeding was a nightmare meal time was a nightmare and so it was like two and a half years of trying to keep weight on her while she was choking and vomiting a lot so it was a very very stressful two and a half years of my life <laughs> and you know flipping her over and doing all of that you know I'd be out in the park I'd be at a train station anywhere and everywhere you could think of she would be choking and it and like, I think I would just go into that autopilot mode, you know, where I'd like flip the flipper over and stuff. But for those that have never experienced that before, I think it would be incredibly frightening the first time. But she would be the child that would be playing. There'd be six children sitting on the floor playing and she would be the one child that would get something stuck in her throat while the other five would just be, you know, fine as anything. So the choking thing has always been huge for me. And it's very scary for parents too, you know, because yeah. there's two types of choking that we look out for. Mm -hmm. So there's a partial obstruction. Mm -hmm. So this is where they're coughing or they're gagging. They can still breathe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like Halloween when they actually um, have a lollipop and they don't actually chew it properly and then that gets stuck, mm -hmm. but they can still cough and things. So basically we don't really have to do anything with a partial obstruction, mm -hmm. but then it's when it's a full obstruction when they actually do stop breathing, you know, and mm. that's really scary. And, yeah, that's when we give them those back blows and chest thrusts if we need to. Yes, 
Yeah, definitely. So when you're teaching that for babies versus toddlers versus older children, kind of what would be the different steps people could do? Well, there's not really a lot of difference at all. I, I say to people, um, you know, like as an adult, um, how does it feel when someone comes and gives you a big whack on the back? You know, how are you going, mate? And mm -hmm. it takes that wind out of you. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the sort of thing you're doing when you're giving a back blow, you you know, putting the heel of your hand between their shoulder blades and, and mm -hmm. you're giving them a good whack on the back. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of parents um, that I've spoken to tend to not do it so hard the first time and then realise that you do have to do it quite hard to, um, yeah, remove that choking obstruction. Yes, you do have to do it quite hard. And that's a bit traumatic in itself, isn't it, to, to thump your child? Um, it is. Yeah, it's not something I um, I, I, I um, relish doing. <laughs> relish is not a good word, but do you know what I mean? And yeah. um, interesting, you talked about the head injuries. So one day, one afternoon here, about two years ago, we'd not long been living in our new house. I had one child on the trampoline. And she stood on the edge and she was jumping off the trampoline, but somehow managed to somersault in the air and land on her head. So I raced down to the yard to triage that situation because I saw it happening in slow motion. And I have a family member who's a paraplegic, so I'm hypersensitive about neck injuries and back injuries. So triage that situation. After about 20 minutes, we were okay to walk and everything else. And like my adrenaline was just going through the roof. We came inside to kind of cool down or whatever. And then the toddler at the time trips and nose butts the handle on the pull out door of the fridge. And I'm thinking broken nose, blood, hustle, there's blood all over the kitchen floor. And this is all in the space of like half an hour to yeah. potential neck and brain head injuries, trauma. And I was just thinking like, oh, my God, how is this possible that I'm having to triage these two potentially? <laughs> you know, I didn't have to take either to the ER, thankfully. But, you know, you've got the ice and I'm checking that she's, it was just a nightmare. And um, I don't think I could work in a in a um, emergency room purely for that because my adrenaline levels wouldn't go. <laughs> I'm still sure you've seen a lot of these things yourself. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've seen a three-week-old come in for observation um, because they've fallen off a lounge chair and, you know, people don't think a three-week-old can move, yeah. but they're very wiggly. So, you know, and then you have a four-month-old come in because they've fallen off a change table. Um, yeah. yeah, so so there's lots of things, but... Um, just a week or so ago, my five-year-old nephew um, was actually standing on the coffee table and he put his T-shirt over his knees. Well, he fell back and hit his head and he had the biggest egg on his head. It was huge. Mm. But, you know, with my first aid sessions, um, I teach people what to look out um, concussion-wise and that. But he was absolutely fine, just ended up with this huge egg. And, and when I was talking to him after that, I said, oh, are you laying an egg? Because mm. it was so big. Yes. And so give us an insight into that then when you're talking about concussion, what would you describe to people? Okay. So look at um, the signs of the children. So, okay, yes, they might have a lump. So you basically want you know, we've always called it a googie egg or an egg on their head. Mm -hmm. So um, the bump to actually come out or it might be a cut or a graze. We don't want a soft and spongy, um, you know, spot on their head because that's kind of inward. So um, look for soft and spongy. Um, you don't want loss of consciousness. So if they've fallen over and actually lost consciousness, mm -hmm. um, that's a sign of concussion. Um, vomiting so sometimes they might pump their head and they'll vomit once but if they vomit two or more times you should take them to ED um, and get them checked out because that's another sign of concussion um, seizures so if they seize after a head injury they might have uneven pupils um, arm or leg weakness confusion so like it's hard to tell a baby's confused but you know a toddler 
they might be slurring their speech or bumping into things or falling over. So they're some of the signs you need to look out for when you're looking at um, concussion. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty scary because I've had my both my kids have head butted things, the tiled floor or the door frame and uh, another, you know, I've had these massive things and like it's just so upsetting as well because in those 15 seconds it happens when you see it happen to the time they first start screaming because they've now <laughs> registered what's happened. It's like an eternity of time, isn't it? It is. And, and you know, people just, yeah, they they are very scared of, you know, their children being hurt and they do rush off to the emergency department. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so I think it's good for parents to know what to look out for because mm. they get to emergency and, you know, they might be sitting there for four hours of observation while their child's jumping around the bed, being alert and interactive and they're thinking, oh, why am I sitting here? Mm. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I keep Arnica gel and ice packs on hand for those head butts. <laughs> Definitely. So what's one thing that you would teach parents about first aid? Just one thing if you could. I think um, try not to panic. I mm -hmm. think the very beginning is just take a deep breath mm -hmm. and um, try not to panic because I think that's really important with first aid. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you want to help your child um, when they need you the most. So mm. you just need to take a deep breath before, um, you know, you, you actually decide what to do. Yeah, that's good advice because I'm a helicopter parent. I freely <laughs> admit that. But uh, it took me a long time to make my babies so I don't want to in, have them injured or lose them in any way. So what advice do you give for helicopter mums like me? Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I was going to say, try not to wrap them in cotton wool. <laughs> and it's really hard, you know, when, when you, you know, you are a protective parent and you want to do the best for your child and, you know, keep them safe. But I think it's really important as well, um, you know, to let them explore, let them climb, let them get dirty, you know, let them play alone. Um, you know, it's good, like, getting dirty and building a bit of immune system, um, and yeah, they, you know, might get a graze on their knee or a bump on their head, but I, I think it, it's good just to let them, you know, slowly, slowly, because sometimes it's hard to do these things, mm -hmm. but yeah, just let them do some things, um, you know, and have a little bit of independence. I would try to remind myself of this because um, I grew up on a cattle station, so we didn't have a doctor nearby. Uh, my parents had four kids by the time they were 26 and we were very much free range you know they didn't know where we were from breakfast till dinner time and we just came home and we were hungry yep. so we were out encountering all manners of you know deadly animals and you know fighting and building bridges and forts and all kinds of things and riding my horse bare back with no helmet on all over the place so like I had that very um free childhood where I was you know all the time injuring myself and now I have these two kids who I'm trying not to um again yeah wrapping cotton wool but also there's a bit of a balance between what I had versus what they've got you know what I mean yes yes <laughs> but one thing I'm very grateful for is um when I lived in the UK I spent two years training with St John's Ambulance so I had a lot of um base in first aid training across and I've had to be first responder in a lot of emergency situations unfortunately generally those that involve a lot of blood <laughs> so yeah. um, I've had to deal with that a lot and out and about in public and stuff so when it comes to things at home I probably am one of the best people that you would want to have nearby when things happen but equally I do know that for a lot of people that don't have that same level of awareness you know things can go wrong very very quickly and whenever I see a child is lost to something like choking or accidental you know I call it maybe accidental neglect where people might be too carefree or the child's run over by a car or you know all of these things that can happen through mis misfortune and everything else it just makes my heart break you know and I just really want to help 
for parents as much as possible, you know, keep their children alive and safe. And I guess that's your overwhelming mission too. Definitely. I mean, you know, our, our little people are so important. They're so precious to us. And I'm so passionate about teaching parents, you know, what to do if they need help or if their mm -hmm. child's sick or in an emergency. Um, it's, it's really important because we want to see them grow up. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you for thank you for filling that gap in the market. And I was discussing with you recently. I'm on a little bit of a a mission at the moment to help um, identify the difference between hustling and helping. So hustling is when we're out rushing to get things done and build a business and do our job and make money and all the rest of it versus helping which is that unconditional support and goodwill that comes with giving back to our community um, and through helping in one area help comes to you in another area and that's certainly my experience because I help a lot of people and those people don't directly help me but in helping those people a lot of other people who I don't know or who I do know they come to help me without me asking them and I, I'm just kind of curious to get your views on the helping versus hustling effect because I know that parent medic is a social enterprise um, and how you've kind of um, positioned your business in your mind yeah so I love um, I love the idea of social enterprise mm -hmm. um, it's basically good people doing good so um, as a social enterprise I'm able to go um, out to rural areas, um, you know, where they don't have a lot of services or they might not have a birthing hospital, for example, and they're travelling a couple of hours to birth children or it might be a three-hour drive, you know, if their children, babies are in NICU or um, special care. Um, so one of the good things um, that's happened is that the Whitsunday um, Regional Council um, employ me and I, I give a discounted um, price so I'm not making a lot of money out of it um, but those families in those areas are actually getting access to baby first aid for free mm -hmm. and you know so it's not all about the hustling and making lots of money but it's um, you know just doing good and and you know having a purpose so mm -hmm purpose over profit, mm -hmm. um, also going into communities um, like Indigenous um, communities. Um, so I've worked with TARS in Townsville and at six in Mackay um, and also like Share House where, you know, they're um, families that may be, um, you know, without accommodation mm -hmm. or becoming, you know, without accommodation and Share House helped them out. So I can go into them and, you know, all these people have been able to access this information for free. Mm. So I think, um, and, and like you're saying, you know, um, yeah, it's like manifesting good, I, I suppose, or manifesting help. So, you know, you're helping people directly, but they're not directly coming back to you. But I find like in the business circle and the social enterprise circle in Townsville is absolutely amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, gone are the days where we held the secrets and didn't tell anybody what our business was about. Mm -hmm. um, but we have so many good people. And, you know, especially in North Queensland, we have a great circle um, of business people um, that help each other out and are there to help each other, which is fantastic. Yeah, and it creates its own kind of circular, circular economy, doesn't it? It still sure does. And I call it the circle of goodwill too because when I see people um, offering unconditional support versus what I call transactional support, give me money and I'll support you, that's the transaction as opposed to goodwill. Goodwill um, support brings with it its own rewards that are untangible and, and um, intangible and un. Um, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like unrecordable. They're the qualitative measures as opposed to the quantitative measures. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, and it and it gives you the warm and fuzzies, doesn't it? It's that's like, right. Yeah, you know, um, I think that's it. So, but yeah, I think I mean... as well, you mentioned about good for good, and it's almost like you're using your skills or you're making your your skills that you've been fortunate enough to gain over the years available to others uh, and you're 
you're creating your own legacy of giving back through using the skills and experience that you've you've been fortunate to learn. Yeah, definitely. I think it's so important to actually give, um, you know, just it just um, I'm just so passionate about it. And, mm -hmm. you know, like if you can save children's lives and things, you know, that's really important. But, you know, another thing um, that my business does is by educating people and empowering, you know, parents to look after their children, we're actually taking some pressure off our emergency departments. Yes. So as we know, all around Australia at the moment, you know, the ambulances are ramping and taking longer time to get to emergencies and, you know, the hospitals are, you know, overloaded and, mm -hmm. yeah, and if I can just educate people to know, you know, how to look after their kids in their own home, rather than rushing to emergency if they don't want, you know, don't need to, mm. then we're actually alleviating that pressure as well. So, mm. you know, it's a win-win for both, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah, I think we could all benefit from a bit more knowledge around how to look after ourselves as well as our children, to be honest, because, yeah, spending time at the hospital, with all due respect, is not my favourite thing to do. <laughs> no. I've been there far too much in my life. So um, thank you for joining me. Um, I think I just wanted to kind of close by saying, okay, well, give me a in brief insight as to what areas you cover and what services you have. And if people want to reach out to you, how they can do that. Okay. So um, the topics we cover, we do a two hour session. Um, so that can be in your own home or we do public sessions in Cairns, Townsville and Mackay, but also remembering the Whit Sundays um, have sessions ongoing in Bowen, Collinsville, Cannonvale and Proserpine. Mm -hmm. But I'm open to going to other areas, right up to Cairns, Atherton Tablelands, um, right throughout. I was in Moran Bar um, mm -hmm. a fortnight ago. So yeah, just yell out. Um, so we do breathing, we do um, CPR, poisons, burns, allergies and anaphylaxis, mm -hmm. choking, head injuries, mm -hmm. um, amongst others. So mm -hmm. there's lots of topics we cover. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Parent Medic. If you look up Parent Medic North Queensland, we've got Instagram. Um, we're on Facebook um, for the business world. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, and, yeah, we've got our website, parentmedic.co. Um, and I'll be um, on TikTok very shortly. Wow, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter says, Mum, can we do TikTok? And I said, no, we cannot. <laughs> I'm not ready for another platform. Um, that's awesome. And you mentioned earlier that to me that Parent Medic is also has a, a hub in Victoria. So I'm assuming that there is people in Victoria like yourself offering a similar service. Yeah, so um, there's two ladies like me, so they're both nurses um, and they're actually located in Victoria. Um, so that's Parent Medic Victoria. Um, one of the girls lives in Melbourne and one of the girls lives in Geelong mm -hmm. and um, they offer services right throughout um, Victoria. Um, in saying that, we also have an online product as well. So if people can't actually um, get you know, into a face-to-face -face first aid session, um, contact us um, anywhere around Australia and we can um, put you in the right place to our online product as well. Mm. Well, thank you very much for the valuable work that you're doing. My brain's ticking over, so I'll be sending some people your way soon. Um, but, but if people want to reach out to you, like they said, you, they can contact you on your socials and I'll put the links um, also in the notes to, the, to this interview. So have a lovely Christmas. Stay yes. hydrated. <laughs> yes, yes. Dehydration, we need to, that's a whole different story for parents as well as children, right? Exactly. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Loretta, and I'll talk to you again real soon. Thanks, Chrissy. Bye-bye. <laughs>